Hi friends and welcome back to my channel. My name is Tammy Ernest and I am a long arm quilter and here on my channel I like to share customer finishes as well as my own personal projects. So it's only been a couple days since I filmed my last video but I really want to get back on my schedule of um, posting videos on Wednesday instead of Friday. So I am going to show you my progress in the last few days. So I don't have as much progress on my personal things. I have quite a few customer quilts. Um, I'm going to show you some quilts that have already gone home, so we'll be looking at some photos of those. But I want to um, get back on that rotation so I can get my videos out on Wednesday. So we're filming this one just a couple days after my last one. So today I wanted to tell you um, or to show you a little bit of my progress on my temperature quilt. I don't have a whole lot, again, because I said it's only um, been just a couple days. But I want to just show you some things that I'm learning and um, some, um, some of my progress. So this is the 2024 Cottage Temperature Quilt. This is a free pattern by Fat Corner Shop. The idea of a temperature quilt is that you record the temperatures in your area um, in fabric. And so this does, I am doing high temperature for each day of the year. Each house represents one month, and then each one of the half square triangles represents the temperature for that day. There is, this is, like I said, this is a free pattern, and um, part of the pattern, they give you colorways that you can use. I believe these are Bella Solids. Uh, you can buy this. Um, I have chosen linen, my first time using linen, and I'm learning quite a bit. And then I have chosen um, fabrics that, that coordinated with these colors. So you're going, the colder temperatures are in the, uh, the purples, and then it graduates, um, to the blues and then as your temperature gets warmer we get to the warmer colors the the reds um, are down towards the end so these are the fabrics that I am using I have made and I didn't bring my um, I didn't bring I didn't bring everything with me today <laughs> I just brought what I am currently working on so I'm still working on January I'm just I'm a tad bit behind I'm getting uh, caught up here what I did was go on to, um, the pattern suggests a website that you can go that tracks your temperature. I did that, I don't have that, yes I do. Let me find it real quick here. I have my computer right here in front of me. And let me see if I can find. So it's just weather.gov is the um, website and you put in your zip code for your area and it'll bring up, um, It'll, it'll bring up your closest weather station. So I'm living, I live in Greencastle, Indiana. I'm about an hour west of Indianapolis, but the, on here, the, the closest thing it brings up to me is Indianapolis. I can't imagine that Indianapolis high temperature is much different than what I'm getting out here in Greencastle, so that's what I'm going with. And I, you can do past data, and so I went in and just, I clicked it on for January. I highlighted um, the whole table and put it into a Word document. So I don't need any of this stuff over here, but it all was just part of the table. So it gives me the date, and it, this first column gives me the high temperature for the day, so that's what I'm working off of. Um, there is a sheet, I didn't bring that either, there is a sheet in the pattern that where you can write down every day, so you're welcome to do that as well because I'm working a little bit behind. It was just easier to do this, so I may just do this once a month. I need to get caught up on the January, February blocks, obviously, um, but you know, maybe just towards the end of the month I print out the, the highs or, you know, I, I don't know, I gotta get caught up first, but that's how I have... Um, done the highs for the day. Some people do high and low, one on one side of the half square triangle, low on the other, you know, so high on one, low on the other one. You do what you feel is best. Some will do average temperature for the day. I'm, um, I'm doing high temperature. We have had quite the fluctuation in temperatures over the last couple months. Um, today it's been in the 70s and tomorrow maybe in the 40s. So Somebody mentioned the other day, it'll make a really pretty temperature quilt <laughs> because of all the different colors I'll be using. So I mentioned this before, but I am using this little recipe box and um, I did not bring all of my fat quarters to show you and how I've laid it out with the triangles on a roll. You can jump back to last week's video or maybe the week before um, where I talk where I show you some of those laid out. But I have 
um, cut those apart. This one is still in uh, the square. Um, but then I, I'm actually labeling them too, so this says A on it. That's because if it gets separated from the other stuff, I don't wanna have to go back and, it's just taking a step out. That way I don't have to go back and match it up to a color. It already has a, an A on it, which means it's this purple one right here. I just put letters across that. So I'm keeping all of those in this little recipe box that I have. You can see I've labeled the, the um, the dividers and then I just have my triangles in there. Um, really handy. It's worked out really well for that. Next what I've been doing is I've been laying out the blocks. Again this is January so I've been laying out the blocks on a design board and I have the first week done. You can see that across the top. So blues, so those were all like in the 30s temperatures. So just two colorways that time. And then what I've done is I've gone ahead and laid out the next um, the next week. And So this is not the week, it's six days. So you have six in a row, five down. So I'm laying those out. And then what I'm going to do is um, take each one press it open, remove the paper, press it open, and attach it to the next one. I figured if I laid it out and kept it very organized on here, then I'm not gonna get ones um, confused. So that's where I'm at right now. I've done the first one, and I did pin this to the design board. It wasn't gonna stay if I didn't. So a couple things that I'm learning. One, I have learned that when you, so triangles on a roll, this gives you the exact two and a half inch or whatever size you're, you're using. Um, so this gives the exact size. The only thing that needs to be done is those little dog ears need to be clipped off. Otherwise, you know, when you sew this and press it open, it's the exact size that you need. So I'm laying out, you know, six, um, in a row, and then there are five rows, so I have four of the uh, rows laid out here. Each one of them is marked, so if I, um, you know, misplace it until I pull that paper off, it's still good. But then even after that, I'd be able to check the color on it. Um, I am pressing my seams to one side towards the dark side. I am finding with the linen that my antique iron is a tad hot for the linen. I need to begin, I need to press with the, uh, like just my domestic iron that I use um, around the house. Um, my antique one seems to be a little hot. Either that or I did not um, shrink the white one enough. It seems like my white linen is shrinking a little more than my colored ones. So either I didn't do a good enough job best pressing those. So if you remember, the colors were all in fat quarters where the uh, white linen I bought is yardage. So um, I may need to go back and just do a better job of the pieces I haven't done yet is to um, best press those a little better so that they're not gonna shrink. And I'm also gonna switch to my other iron. I feel like my antique iron is just a little too hot for this. Um, but I am doing high temperature and then all of the white is the same on the other half of each of those half square triangles. The half square triangle block is exactly the size that you need. It's not like you're making it any larger and then you're trimming it to two and a half. When you press this open, it is two and a half. The only thing there is the dog ears that need to be trimmed off. So I'm learning, I'm learning um, pressing, starching, and um, linen <laughs> all at once. And and the triangles on the roll I've enjoyed. It You know, it's like mindless, stitching when you're just running those through the sewing machine. You do need to use a little bit of a smaller stitch from what they suggest. That makes the papers peel away that much easier. But I'm learning and um, I'm going to try to get this block together very soon so that um, I can see how this one does and just, and just continue learning. I'll let you know my progress. Last week I did show you the Metal Lark song quilt that I'm working on for a client. I do have all of the borders on now. And um, I did bring it again today. I'm, I'm picking up a backing fabric. I told you last week that I thought I had the backing. Um, either I've misplaced it in moving from <laughs> the upstairs to the downstairs or I never bought it in the first place. So I will be out tomorrow and I will be picking that up a backing for this and so it will be going on the long arm later this week and I will be showing that to you next week. But I do have all the borders on the front. This is ready.
But I wanted to um, talk again about how I press my borders. I mentioned that last week in my last week's video about only pressing those seams that I absolutely needed to in order to attach the borders. And someone asked me in the comments, does that mean that you always press open? Is that better on the long arm? Um, and kind of what my pressing um, preference was. On the long arm, I have no preference. Um, the, an open seam lies a little flatter, but the thing I notice with um, open seams is if it's not um, backstitched or um, sometimes those seem to pull apart. Not that they're pulling apart any more than one that's pressed to one side, but when you're pressing to one side, you still have an extra layer of fabric underneath there. When you are pressing, let me just grab this. Okay, so like this is just one unit that is part of this quilt. This was used in the nine patches, and you'll notice on these units, I did press towards the um, dark side, and so this would have been joined with one, a nine patch that had a dark in the middle and two lights and then one just like this. Because I know these seams nest very well together or they'll nest together, I know what I'm attaching it to, um, I will press to the dark side. So if this is on the long arm and it gets pulled apart a little bit, do you see how I still have fabric underneath there? Um, if I have a seam that is pressed open like this one is, and I'll show you the back of this one in just a minute, but do you see when I pull it apart, there is, there's nothing under there. So I really encourage you, um, this happens mostly on, on the edges, uh, around the edge of a quilt, is that if you do not backstitch or if you do not do a victory lap, is what I've heard it um, described as, around the edge of your quilt, then sometimes because of the way it's loaded on the long arm, you we're keeping it taut because you don't want any ripples and you're wanting um, everything nice and flat and there is some tension on those um, on those seams. So if you, I would just encourage you to backstitch any seams that are along the edge of your quilt um, or if you've got a lot of piecing around the edge, then it's always good to um, do a whole stay stitch all the way around. If you have a quilt like this, now I, I typically always backstitch, so, um, so this is not gonna come apart. But on this seam, this is the only, this seam and on the other respective end of it are the only two seams around, um, you know, on this side of the quilt. And so there, there's no need to do a stay stitch all the way around if you've got borders like this on there. You really just need to do over that one um, seam or if you backstitch then it's fine. So um, let me go back to this and my pressing. So on this block here is the full nine patch. You can see the rows I pressed to um, the dark side but when I when I completed this block then the seams that were used to um, join those rows together, I actually press those open. And the reason is, it's because when I am joining this, in this block was finished like this. So there are four of those nine patches together. If I press to one side, then I feel like I'm limited to what I can join next to it. So if this is pressed all down, let's say, and I am joining it to another nine patch next to it. I feel like those all need to be pressed up for those seams to nest together. Otherwise, I'm going to get, you know, four layers of fabric right there, and I don't want that. So by pressing these open, I was not limited to how I joined it with the block next to it. If I laid it out in the block next to it, there was another red square here. I can rotate it one turn um, to get a different color here you know, and then I'm not worrying about what seams I have on the back and are they going to nest together. They're all open. Now, um, you're going to ask me, you know, that does that matter <laughs> on those? Let me just show you the back of one of these. So here's the back of the nine patch. Um, it's not perfect. I can see that I, I flipped one little edge over there. 
but when I joined these together, all of the individual nine patches, they are pressed to the dark side. Then when I joined them to the one next to it, all of those seams are pressed open. Do you see that? All of those seams are pressed open. That way, if I was laying this quilt out and I had, um, you know, maybe I had this rotated and I had, you're seeing all the back sides, but if I had this blue right here, then I could just rotate this block around till I got the mustard color there um, because I wanted a, a diverse unit right there, okay? Um, so by pressing the seams open, I was not limited to how I could piece it together. I was able to rotate those blocks around till the color was were the way that I wanted. I knew all my seams were gonna be pressed open and they are gonna match up, if that makes sense. Then these blocks around the edge out here, these were not pressed open because I was joining it to just one piece of fabric right here. This was a triangle unit that went right here. So when I'm joining all of these seams to one piece of fabric, I press that towards the one piece of fabric because there's no need, there's, I don't have any extra bulk on this side. So it's just easier to press those to that, um, to that piece of fabric. Similar to how I do the borders. So the borders, because there's a lot of piecing in here, all of these, these seams were pressed open. These seams along the border are just pressed towards that, that yardage because I don't need to add more bulk into where the piecing is. It doesn't lay very flat for one. So if I press it towards just the single piece of fabric, then it kind of spreads out the thicknesses there. So then, Here's the back of one of the star blocks. Here's the front, first of all. There's what the star blocks look like. So when I piece this one, let me see what I did on this one. Anytime there was a half square triangle, it's pressed towards the dark side. That's easier, I think. You can press them open, but I tend to do half square triangles. I press them towards the dark side. If I'm adding easy corner triangles, which is what this one was, um, let me see what that piece is. Okay. The, these easy corner triangles, the reason they are pressed to the white side is because this was a rectangle right here and you're adding the, the square unit on top. And then, let me show you on this one. So you start out with the rectangle of fabric and then you're adding a square unit on top of it, okay? So you can see it's, the fabrics um, are layered that way. That square is on the top. So then I never, I never trim this, the back pieces, until I have pressed that top piece over and matched it up with that, um, that back rectangle. I know that that rectangle was square. So I don't want to trim these backing fabrics and then try to press this open because it may not it may not be square. As often as I can, I leave that back fabric there. I press that easy corner triangle exactly to that corner. When it's nice and pressed, then I'll fold that forward and I'll cut those extra two pieces off the back. So when I do that, then that leaves the seam pressed towards the easy corner triangle. Okay, so that's why that one looks the way it does. And that's what you're seeing on the star block. That's why these pieces are pressed towards the light side. It's just because that was the, the square that went on the end of that corner. Here is a half square triangle and that one I have pressed towards the dark side. This block was easy corner triangle, so that's why they're pressed that direction. Um, this was a pieced one. You can see a lot of piecing on this little middle part. And so when, um, I think it was a pinwheel. It's a pinwheel in the center. And so those were pressed to one side, but then when I joined those pinwheels together, I pressed those seams open. So I don't have, um, 
I kind of get my own rhythm down. I, I have to think about why do I do what I do. And so anytime that there's a lot of bulk, I will try to press towards the side where there's going to be less bulk. And so that's why in the borders, that's why those are pressed towards the border on both directions because there's less bulk there. When I'm joining pieces, you know, piece pieces like in here, I'll do those open um, just so that I don't have to worry about what it's being matched up to on the outside. These were fine. You know, these blocks, there wasn't a lot of piecing um, when I'm joining the flower block with the nine patch block. So on the long arm, it'll go over any, any, um, any bulk that's there as long as you can press it as flat as you can and I can hear it when it's running I can hear when it hit a heavy seam I it doesn't knock the tension off it doesn't do any damage to the machine but I I can hear it when it hits a heavier seam so make your seams as flat as possible but that's just kind of my logic and when I'm piecing a quilt I don't always follow what the pattern says some patterns will, sh will show you in a diagram press seams this way or that way I tend to look at them, but I don't always follow what they do. Sometimes I'll press open just because I don't want to have to worry later whether that seam's going to nest together. It kind of depends on what I'm, I'm joining it to next time. But it's not a preference because of the long arm. That's just my preference in piecing. So if you have any other questions about that, just put them in the comments. Um, I'm not saying my way's right. I am just saying this is the way I do it. <laughs> and... Um, and it works for me. If it doesn't work for you, you um, are welcome to find your own way and to, you know, go off what somebody else says. It's just we're we're all individuals, and um, that's just the way I do it. And if that's a help to you, great. If it's not, then uh, no worries. All right, that's the Meadowlark song quilt. All right, let's move on. I have several quilts that have gone home already, so let me insert some pictures, and then I'll talk um, about those a little bit. So this first one is Sarah's quilt, and um, this has already gone home, so I don't have it in my hands to show you, but in looking at this pattern, um, I've either done this one before for Sarah or somebody else. It, it very um, much resembles like a three yard quilt. If you notice in this, there are only two blocks in this, and but um, it's deceiving in how it's put together. So if you see, it's really just like a square next to, um, uh, so you have one square, the zebra print is one square, and then the, the block next to it is just a split rail fence or whatever they call that. It's the three pieces of fabric um, pieced together. And then the next row down, you have that split rail, that rail fence block turned horizontal and then next to the zebra print. And so it gives the effect that the square is around one zebra print and not around the other zebra print. So this one has to be laid out um, fairly well or the it's not gonna work. You're gonna have to lay this one out to get the effect of those squares around each one. I don't know that this is a three yard quilt. I don't have information on the pattern itself, but um, you can see by looking at it that that's how it's it comes together. There are some squares along the edge um, that binding to complete that that square so you have a little different part on the edge there so I don't have information about the fabric itself the backing fabric this is a Kimberbell 108 inch wide backing um, done by Maywood and it's really pretty on the back of this so for the pantograph for this one because of all the zebras we chose the woven wind pantograph so not you know by the name it's meant to be for wind or that's what it reminds you of but when Sarah and I were looking through pantographs and uh, we came across this one she's like well doesn't that look like the zebra stripes like down you know his torso belly area and this was just a really cute effect so um, you're adding texture in there without doing um, 
a zebra or an animal. I really like just adding texture on. Let the let it complement the the fabrics, um, but not overpower them. Meaning we're not doing another zebra design on top of um, the zebra fabrics that are already there. The the complement comes with just that kind of striped effect and it was really cute. I believe we used um, a medium gray or a light gray thread on this one. Blends with all the fabrics and it is really, really cute. I have a couple other baby quilts that have already gone home. Let me show you some pictures of the first one. Judy had a, a whole slew of baby quilts for me the last time I met with her. And this first one is a simple, again, it's that, that rail fence block, and then it's paired with some applique blocks. So a simple shape. You could even use, you know, if you don't have the applique shape, I'm not sure whether she used a template or something. You could use um, a cookie cutter. Maybe you have a big heart cookie cutter and you want to use that as your template for your applique or a big, um, like um, a big heart or maybe a snowflake or, or something like that. Something that's a little chunkier that you're not getting into real tiny pieces. But this is a great way to use up fabrics, use up some scrap that you have. She's done the yellow background behind all the teddy bears. That, they kind of look like gummy bears, don't they? Um, and, um, or the little teddy, the teddy grams, don't they kind of look like that? So, um, she's done applique, this is all machine applique, and then she's got the, the, um, just the rail fence again, not, you know, it does kind of stair step down through the quilt somewhat, and then that really bright, fun, um, border on there is really cute. Backing fabric was a red, and then... The pantograph we chose this one is the wishbone pantograph. This one always adds a lot of good texture to a quilt. Again, we didn't need to um, repeat the teddy bear pattern. We could have, and um, and I have, but on this one I just felt like the wishbone just added a lot of texture. We're not competing with any of the applique, especially with that um, kind of wild border there. Didn't want to do anything that was going to um, just kind of... Um, clash with that I guess. So this um, wishbone pantograph is a great one for um, lots of texture. All right here's Judy's second quilt. Judy's second one is made from eight blocks. These are set on point with the blue setting triangles as well. I don't have information on the pattern. This would be a great one to sit down with graph paper and you could um, figure out how to do the measurements on that and uh, to do all the, the different little rectangles and things there. She's done a yellow border and then repeated that blue from the setting triangles into the outer border and uh, the backing was another blue. She was trying to use up some things from her stash. This is a great way, just make some baby blankets, whether you've got babies in uh, your future like I do, <laughs> grandbabies that is, and, um, or whether you don donate them to, um, to your guild so that they can pass those on. We chose the, um, with this one, because some of the fabrics had balloons and things, um, and kind of the starry fabrics with the blue and the white stars. We chose what's called floating clouds. And this one kind of has a circular feel, but doesn't close all of those circulars, uh, circles completely. And it, so it kind of builds on itself. Um, this is a, a pattern similar to this that I would do a lot of times on hand guided because you can start, and actually, if you're doing hand guided, I think it's easier to do clouds upside down. Uh, and the reason is is because when you're when you're doing clouds 
uh, on hand guided, they're going up and around and then you're you're like echoing, not really echoing because you don't want to go straight over the same hump, but you kind of want to offset those and you're doing those humps. And but because you have your bar in the front of you, it's hard to match up the next row. So I always did clouds upside down. So I would actually be going this way doing it so like it it's the a dip and then when I rotated I could I could just continue on with the next row to make those clouds so you it's it's not um, completely horizontal so with clouds you're kind of sweeping around you're you're making little you know a cloud here and a cloud here and then when you um, kind of sweep behind it then you're making it look like those clouds are coming ahead but very similar to this pantograph you can uh, kind of see that quilting um, doesn't stand out a whole lot just because the fabrics are so busy but you can kind of see how um, it not necessarily echoes but it um, it comes in like if you've got a circle here then it's coming in and hitting that point that circle as some other point on there and um, it's a good one to practice. Practice on your marker board <laughs> with your um, with your marker held in your hand, just like you would on the the handlebars of your um, machine. And practice that way, not like this, like you're writing, but hold it like you do your your handles on your machine, and just practice that. Um, practice it upside down. Practice getting into a corner, and how do you get yourself back out? And if you're doing digital, um, then you find this pantograph, floating clouds really really cute all right let's move on to judy's third quilt Judy's third one is another split or is another rail fence or split rail fence, whatever you want to call it. I have this theme going on every, it's so funny how um, each time when I sit down to do a video, there seems to be some sort of theme in the quilts and that's not done on any um, planning on my part. It's just whatever came through. And, um, but this quilt has also gone home as well. Again, it's the rail fence. So you can see this time though, um, it's only two fabrics instead of three like we've seen before so like in the top left corner you have a blue and a white horizontal and then you have that blue and the white turned vertical and then the third way you have the blue and the white horizontal again and then the row below that it's vertical horizontal vertical and so just two strips of fabric instead of the three you still get that stair step almost on this one it almost gives it like a, a puzzle type um, feel to it but your your blocks you've got four blocks across five blocks down all different fabrics but they coordinate well so choose four or five fabrics and um, create your strips and then she's got a nice green border that's repeated the board the green border is some of the fabrics that were used in those blocks and then um, just a fun print to kind of tie all those colors together and she had a pieced backing on this one, a great way. This was um, flannels and a pieced backing and a, a great way, again, to use up your scraps. And then for this one, we did the deer heart pantograph. You notice in the border print, we had all of those hearts. And so um, this was one because there weren't a lot of hearts in the main part of the quilt. We are repeating the pattern that I see in the border. So different quilts, you know, just get your inspiration from the fabrics or the feel. Um, all different ways that you can find a pantograph for your quilt. This one we chose the border fabric and, and repeated that heart pattern. This one stitches out horizontally so you have a heart up um, and then a heart down and then you can nest these as close as you want to together. They kind of look like they're all, they're all strung on, uh, on a garland there or something. So a really cute quilt. All right, I have one more by Judy.
Jenny's last one. Quilting doesn't have to be hard. We've just got squares. She's alternated the blue squares. Different fabrics. They're not all the same fabric, but they're all in the blues. So you have a dark and you have a light, and she's alternating those. You have some pinks, you have some whites, um, almost some melon type color, the pink in that one. So just squares put together, all bright, fun prints there. Just really, really cute. This pantograph is the Giggle pantograph, and I just love this one. It's um, nice. It's just a playful, playful pantograph. Big swirls, um, big loops, nothing tight about this one. Just you've got the, you know, the big bubble, I don't know, almost like a lollipop type thing or something, and just a lot of fun. This one just added a lot of texture on top of it. Um, there are some circles in some of the prints, so you kind of have that same feel in the circle. Um, but nothing too straight because we're using all squares here. We just wanted this one to stay light and fun and airy, so um, that's the reason we went with the Giggle. I, Giggle's just a fun one for um, a kid quilt. Any, any toddler um, baby quilt that you're working on, it's, it's a go-to if you just want to add some playfulness to it. And Judy also had a pieced backing on this one as well. You see how she's used some of the fabrics that were left from the front, pieced it all together until it was large enough for um, a backing, and and away we went <laughs> and finished that one up. So those four quilts of Judy's have all gone home. And um, let's move on to this table runner next. So Kathy's table topper, or this could be a wall hanging. I'm not sure what she's going to do with it. She said this was pieced many years ago. Um, just the log cabin in the middle, really cute. Log cabin with uh, the checkerboard window there, the chimneys on the top. A lot of half square triangles. We've got a couple evergreen trees here. And uh, the whole border is very interesting, really neat. A lot of um, interest added by changing. Do you see the, the flying geese unit? Let me see, are they flying geese? Yes, they are flying geese units where you have, um, you would start out with a rectangle, do an easy corner triangle here that's in the white, easy corner triangle on the other side that's the red, and then look how it makes that border there. Really cute like the different fabrics behind the tree too, instead of just having one whole background fabric. Blocks across the bottom. She said this was done many years ago. She's just finally getting it quilt because, quilted because every quilt is worth finishing. <laughs> this one measures 31 by 56, if I haven't said that already. The back, she just did um, like a homespun, a green homespun. All right, and the pantograph for this one, because this one had a little bit of a wintry feel, um, a lot of straight angles, I decided to go with curls and swirls. We used this a couple times last week, and you can see um, how it just added a lot of uh, dimension to this one, kind of kept up with the, the outdoorsy feel to it, I wanna say. Thread color. All right, for thread color on this one, we used Omni Thread. I use um, Omni Thread typically in my machine. This was 3068. 3068 is this. It's a darker, let me, it's a darker cream, almost a tannish, um, but it's easier to tell when I hold others next to it. So this is cream here. This one doesn't have a name. It's just numbered 3068. Here is an almond. So I use the darker of the three. You see the numbers. This is 3004, 3005, 3068. So now this is the one I used on Kathy's quilt. So would the others have worked? Yes. I felt like these um, colors were on the, the hue of them was a little darker um, with the reds and the, and the dark blues. 
Some of the fabrics were a little darker as well. Even this, this is not a true white, um, more of a muslin type look. So here is the 3068. So it looks a little dark when you hold this up, but, re but remember that's like thousands of um, little threads. You're only doing it once. Um, so it's not as dark as the whole, um, the whole cone appears. But here's what, if I'd done a lighter one, it matches this a little bit better, but it's a little brighter than even on the, on the blues. I don't know how well that's going to show up. But because I have some darker fabrics here and these are not true whites, I went with just a, the little bit of a darker one. Um, the whole tone of the quilt is a little darker. It feels more like a winter scene, so I didn't need to brighten it up any. This is uh, the cream one. I just didn't need, it's bright enough. I mean, even that thread, you can see how well it stands out on those darker prints. So it still kind of brightens it up some, but I think using a cream or any lighter color was just gonna brighten it up more and we didn't need to do that. So this is curls and swirls. This is much tighter than I did it last week on some other quilts. Um, but again, the scale of this quilt is smaller. The piecing is smaller. And so just try to orient your, your pantograph size with the size of um, quilt that you're doing. All right, I have another one of Kathy's to show you. All right, Kathy's second quilt. This one is called Apple Core, and this is a pattern and template by Charlene Jorgensen. I'm not familiar with Charlene, but in um, doing some a little bit of research on the pattern and things, she evidently had some hit TV shows, quilting shows, so maybe you remember her, but I do not. So she had two quilting series, one called Quilting with Char and another called Quilting from the Heartland. Um, this pattern is one that she still sells and has a template for the apple core pattern and there are some YouTube videos as well that show you how to put this one together. Now Kathy's quilt, um, she actually hand pieced all of the apple core parts. I did not watch the YouTube video to know whether it has to be done that way or it can be machine pieced if you're interested in the quilt. Um, I would just refer you to that YouTube video where you watch um, Charlene doing that. But Kathy's quilt anyway was um, all hand pieced on the center. The pattern actually shows a scalloped border, but you can see how Kathy has trimmed it off um, evenly so that she could add other borders on. So she did a, a skinny blue border and then a darker um, calico border around the edge. So Kathy used all calico um, scraps that she had, all reds and blues. Very pretty. The backing fabric, she chose a solid blue. And on that backing fabric, you can see the pantograph. A lot of times when I'm doing these um, quilts like this that um, tend to make you think of quilting in the past. They're a little older. They've just never been finished. I don't tend to do very um, modern or um, newer designs. I think you, even though this one um, has a new twist to it, it is a, this is called feather meander. So a lot of times you would use, you'd see feathers in more traditional type quilts. So this one has a little different take and it's a feather meander. Um, you're echoing that feather a lot of times on these on these quilts, I don't want to do something that um, distracts from the the time period or the um, the feel of the quilt. So a, a feather is pretty much a, a traditional type design. So here the feather, you can see the feather, you know, come around here, and then it's echoed out, and then. Um, so not a traditional where you do feather and feather and feather or one whole big spine. You kind of, you've got some feel of a feather, you got feel of a little swirl, 
um, a bigger swirl here with the feather around it. So it's just a really nice um, feather feel, a little hint towards the past, but making it a little more, um, a little bit more of a modern touch, I want to say. It just, by the meander, you're you're filling in those extra spaces where, uh, you know, a feather, sometimes you would have had a feather along a border and then you would have filled it in with piano keys or some straight lines or some tighter stippling around the feather. This just continues to do feathers and uh, just work its way in and work its way back out. So a feather here and a feather here, but then some off to the side and just all around. The thread color on this one, again, was that 3068. Again, because the whole tone of the quilt is a little darker, the fabrics, the hue of them is a little darker. Um, so that darker thread, um, again, while it's noticeable on the darker fabrics, it doesn't overpower uh, even the, the lighter ones. It blends really well with, um, with these darker, with the, the lighter fabrics that are more of a cream color. Very pretty. All right, let's move on to the next one. So Linda's quilt is again um, along the, the rail fence um, theme, but a little different. So on Linda's, she actually had background or foundation um, squares that she attached these um, the other fabrics to. So this is really two layers thick on the top. So she had like a foundation square and then she would sew um, a, a rectangle here and then a rectangle and then a rectangle. So almost like foundation paper piecing, but it was done with, um, with material. So each one of these squares is like that. And by doing that, she didn't have to stay um, precise. Some are skinny, some are, are um, fatter. You can see here, we've got a skinny one and then a medium and then a fat one. You can see others where they are, um, like this one, they don't have to be symmetrical. It doesn't have to be all um, vertical. She's done it a little bit at a diagonal. So along the, the rail fence line, but just done with a new twist. Now I should have mentioned this earlier, Fat Quarter Shop does have a free PDF. This is um, a quilt size guide for six inch finished rail fence quilt blocks. So if you're wanting to make um, a rail fence quilt. This gives you all of the, the sizes. So it shows you how many blocks you need if you want a crib size all the way up to a, a king. Um, tells you how many of them you need. This is to make a, the um, each quilt block will measure, each quilt block uses three two and a half by six and a half inch pieces. Um, but you can print this out, you can do it in black um, or white, you know, you can do it in color or you can do it in, in black or white. You could even color this in just so you could see how your piecing makes it look like it's um, moving down the, the quilt. So this is free. You can go, um, I put a link down below. You can go check that out if you're wanting to make a, a rail fence block. Linda said this was done many years ago as well. So the fabric lines, um, she said, old fabric, it was done by Camille, by Sentimental Studios and Junko. Backing fabric is a laundry basket quilt um, fabric, though. And it is very pretty. What a nice compliment to the front. Love that. It was a really good choice. So again, you got the little darker on the front, and then we go with a light on the back. Very pretty. So for the pantograph, you might be able to see it on the back a little bit better. This is called Lemon Peel. I like this one. Oh, I just, I like this one. So just three little um, petals, and then it swirls out to the next one, three little petals, and then moves over to the next one. I believe we used this last week too. Um, 
but just adds a, a nice dainty feel. A lot of florals in this one. The backing fabric's floral. Um, so it gives that floral feel, but without being a, you know, a big flower or something like that. Just very dainty. I really like that. And then it adds in a little bit of um, a circular feel, again, without being big swirls or, or being um, like the curls and swirls. Just very dainty. I thought this one was a nice effect. For the um, thread. For thread on this one, I chose, let me find the right number. I chose this one. This is 3016. This is sandstone. So you see how much darker this one is than the 3068 that I used on this one. This is 3016 sandstone, but look at this quilt. So this again has darker feel to it. You could have used this one. It would have been even lighter on this one <laughs> than it was, you know, it would have been lighter on this one than it was how dark it was on this one. So this one I felt um, the sandstone was a better match for it. So like on the front here, it just blends right in with the fabrics. You really don't even see it. On the back, I used a pre-wound bobbin that was a darker tan color and um, it blends right in. So I thought this was a, a good choice on this one. Very pretty. All right, I have another one that has already gone home. Let me show you a picture of that one. Isn't this one pretty? This is Susan's quilt. This is all done in lavender batiks. So Susan actually participated in the puzzle mystery quilt. Um, are you, have you heard of this? I learned this today too. This is so fun. So um, Sheila Christensen is a teacher in New Zealand and every year she does two puzzle mysteries. Um, and so what it is, is um, they're pre-cut. All of the fabrics are pre-cut. When you receive your packet, you get Everything is pre-cut, so all you have to do is sew. Um, they start in February and July, but signups open up in December and May. In the U.S., you can get your monthly kit from Cotton Cuts, and I've linked that down below. Um, if you're in the U.K., you can get your monthly kit from Modern Quilt Club. Those are the two places that you um, can get um, these. So every month, for 10 months, you receive pre-cut pieces of fabric triangle, square, strips. They do all the cutting. You don't have to do any of it. The instructions for turning the pieces into puzzle pieces um, are arrive each month as well. And the 10th month, you receive the key to putting together the whole puzzle. And looking at Susan's quilt, this is just so pretty. Uh, again, this is one of those quilts that you need to lay it out to see it because when it's on the long arm, I'm not seeing the whole pattern. So very, very pretty. Love how the whole thing goes together, how it's um, kind of a medallion middle and radiates from there. All done in the shadings. When you go to um, cotton cuts here in the U.S., you can pick your colorway. So it's not like everybody did the lavender one. They have maybe 10, 15 different colorways that you can choose. Um, so it can be to your liking, but everyone is making the same quilt. Um, but again, it's all cut. You're just piecing. So what a great, um, a great thing. So you'll want to go check that out. Susan's quilt measured 80 by 80, a great size. This was just uh, a real, real beauty, all in batiks. So it's Java batiks, and she did order her, her kit from Cotton Cuts, and um, those are the batiks that they had. So for the pantograph on this one, we chose a new pantograph. This is the first quilt that I have used it on. I've had it for a while, just waiting for the right opportunity to use it. This is called Obsidian and um, kind of the spiral, but it's elongated. So um, just thought this one added, this added um, a lot of swirl, a lot of circular movement to the quilt, complemented the batiks really well. 
And on this one, we used, um, I believe we used a white thread. I didn't write that one down, but a white thread on this one. Again, the, the fabrics are very light. Um, didn't want to heavy, you know, make the quilt any appear any heavier. We just wanted to keep it the light and bright, and so we used the white thread on this one. So obsidian, this was a, a nice pantograph to use. I think it worked really well for this one. All right, one more quilt for today. Cynthia's quilt is so, so fun. We have all flannels on the front, and then on the back she has used this minky. This is almost like fur. It is um, a, a larger pile than, than minky. It's got more of a, a shag, I wanna say. It, it really lays one way or the other. It does, it feels like your pet and cat. It's just incredible. Um, so between the flannel and the batting and the minky on the back, this is a pretty heavy quilt. It's going to be wonderful to lay under. The measure's about 75 by 75. And the, the pattern on this is eyelet lace quilt. So doesn't that look, doesn't it look like the little eyelet lace? That's so pretty. And uh, this is done by uh, Kindred Quilt Company is the pattern for this one. And all of the fabrics that Cynthia has used, this is Cozy Cotton Flannel Over the Moon. This is a Robert Kaufman um, uh, fabric here. So all the yellow, um, browns, and the pinks, even some grays. You can see another eyelet down here. Oh, this feels so good. Very, very nice like how those eyelets are made really neat so a lot of your background you know some simple piecing it's um, easy corner triangles on some rectangles and on some squares there but you've got a lot of background sashing in between to create that eyelet effect very pretty very fun. All right, so the pantograph, we went with the Deer Heart pantograph again. This is one we had used on one of those baby quilts, and um, very pretty. I'll get in here close so you can see it. So sweet with those um, fabrics. A lot of the fabrics have stars and moons and, and sunshine, and then just with the, um, the hearts on top of it, just very sweet. Very sweet quilt. All right, that's all I have for you today. I will be getting lots more done, and I will see you back here next week with lots more customer finishes. If you are in need of long arm quilting services, I hope you will get in touch with me. My information is all down below, and every quilt is worth finishing, so don't leave them in your closet, and uh, don't finish those up and then stick them under a bed. We need to get them finished. So join me back here next week for more customer finishes as well as progress on my own personal quilts. We'll see you then.